Well, thank you, Ahmed, for the uh, introduction, and, and thanks to Rong and Ahmed, really, for uh, organizing these, uh, these seminars and giving me the opportunity to present today. Uh, my lab is interested, so we're located in Ithaca, New York, uh, which is nicely spatially uh, uh, distanced from uh, the rest of the world uh, in upstate New York, so it's a, it's a great place to uh, survive a pandemic. Um, and my lab is interested really in developing genomic medicine tools uh, for infectious disease and immune-related disease. Uh, but in today's talk, uh, I'll focus on our work to develop spatial analysis tools uh, to study microbiomes and developing tissues. Uh, and uh, this is a bit preaching to the choir, but um, it's really an exciting time in bioengineering. Um, the, uh, the tools that, that uh, have become available and the advancements in the tools really quite remarkable in the last uh, few years, uh, specifically tools to analyze uh, single cells. And this is clear from this nice view graph from uh, a review paper from Valentine Svensson. Uh, but it's also clear from a contrast between state of, a state of the art um, uh, data picture from 2014 and 2020 that just nicely illustrates how, uh, how we've come from analysis of a few hundred cells to analysis that span millions of cells. Um, at the same time, uh, spatial analysis tools have been developed, uh, tools such as StarMap and uh, SlideSeq, and these tools now enable us to build tissue atlases uh, uh, that actually have spatial coordinates, and so that is uh, quite amazing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's still some technical challenges that remain. Uh, and I'm highlighting just the ones that, uh, that I'm addressing here uh, gratuitously in, uh, in this talk uh, today. And first of all, uh, uh, the first challenge is that, uh, that single cell and spatial profiling technologies have become very powerful for studies of mammalian tissues, uh, but are somewhat lacking for microbiology and microbiomes. Uh, there's also a, a, a need for tools that can integrate single cell spatial sequencing uh, with morphological data to study disease and development. And then a point that is uh, often underappreciated is that uh, the tools that we're using do not capture all transcriptional activity. And so there's, there's lots, lots of transcriptional dark matter that remains undetected using current approaches. And that's because of limitations of the molecular techniques as well as uh, the data analysis techniques. And I'll briefly touch upon solutions uh, in this talk. And so I would like to start this talk by introducing uh, a, a, a technology that we've recently developed to map complex microbi microbial communities with high spatial and taxonomic resolution. And this is really the graduate work uh, uh, of how she, a very talented uh, graduate student in the lab who will graduate next month if all goes well. Um, who developed this tool uh, because he was interested in, uh, in studying microbiomes and wasn't satisfied with the techniques that were available that, that are very powerful. For example, DNA sequencing based approaches, very powerful to create lists uh, of species that exist in complex microbiomes, uh, but that destroy all the spatial information that exists in these samples. And we were quite interested in studying spatial interactions between microbes within a microbiome, but also between microbes and uh, microbiomes and the host. Uh, and so how uh, develop the technology that will allow us not to make a list, but rather a map of, uh, of dense microbial communities, such as the ones that you, fill, you find in the gut or in biofilms. And so this is uh, just an example image here that shows a raw image, uh, uh, an imaging uh, result here. Uh, and then the spatial digital map that, uh, that we've created from this image. And in the next few minutes, in the next few slides, I will explain how that techniques work and how we can convert uh, this raw image into this digital map. And, and so obviously we're not the first to contemplate to use microscopy to study microbes. Uh, already in the 17th century, uh, Antonie van Leeuwenhoek in the Netherlands, in Delft in fact, uh, developed micro, micros, uh, microscopy techniques to study uh, nature and he essentially discovered microbes and he studied already uh, much like we, will be, we are doing today. Uh, the microbes that live uh, on the skirt of a man's teeth and so we, we essentially just uh, set out to follow up on the work of, uh, of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. In his early work, Anthony also uh, described the different morphologies that these uh, different microbes have and, had, and so described that you know, there's, there's a great diversity of these, these species. Um, since then, of course, technologies have come a long way uh, and uh, techniques have been introduced such as uh, fish, uh, multicolor fish to study these communities with, uh, with greater detail. 
uh, and these, uh, these have led to beautiful images with rich biological information, but if, uh, have been limited by uh, the cost and also the limited uh, multiplexity. That is to say that a limited number of species uh, can be analyzed with existing techniques. Uh, there's many papers, many studies where the relationships uh, between the, the host and the microbiome, and for example, the mouse gut have been reported, but also these, uh, these studies have been limited by uh, scarce phylogenetic information. And again, what I mean to say is that uh, the number of species that, that was resolvable using the techniques that, that were developed uh, was, was quite limited. Uh, biophysicists have been long interested in the mechanical properties of biofilms and sort of the morphologies of cells, uh, bacterial cells within biofilms. Uh, and uh, uh, often these, uh, these studies have reported single cell segmentation, so they achieved single cell resolution. Uh, but these studies have often been limited or mostly limited to lab-grown systems that contain few species. And so we wanted to really test the findings of these different studies uh, in environmental uh, systems. And in order to do that, how developed this technique that he calls hyperfish that has the following features. It allows uh, two to the power n minus one multiplexity where n is the number of fluorophores we will be using in experiments. And as I'll show, uh, we're able to use combinations of up to 10 fluorophores, fluorophores so achieving a multiplexity of about 1,023. Uh, it's also cheaper than existing approaches, about two, uh, two orders of magnitude cheaper than existing approaches. And that is because the cost doesn't scale linearly with the number of taxa that we probe, but log rather uh, logarithmically. Um, and so that allows us to probe large communities in different systems without breaking the bank. Uh, the key ideas that make this possible, I'll go into de in detail soon, but the key ideas that make this possible, uh, first of all, is binary encoding. So what we do is we assign a binary encoding to each uh, species in a community where the zeros and the ones refer to the absence or the presence of a fluorophore. And then we take advantage of the fact that there's many copies of ribosomes in each microbial cell. And uh, uh, that allows us to probe a single cell with a combination of many different uh, fish probes. And so let's imagine that we're trying to probe E. coli here. And the first thing you should realize again is that there's hundreds, not uh, often thousands of copies of the ribosome and ribosomal RNA uh, present in each cell. And this ribosomal RNA is highly conserved. So all microbes have the 16S ribosomal RNA sequence. Uh, but there is uh, uh, there are uh, parts of the, of the gene that uh, that are used for phylogenetic tagging that are specific to specific species. And so we design probes, and I'll, I'll get into the probe design also. We've developed software to do that in an automated fashion. But we design probes that specifically target these uh, sequences or parts of the sequence that are specific to, in this case, E. coli. And then we use a two-step hybridization scheme. So in a normal uh, fish experiment, and this is how this was done in microbiology so far, you would use a sequence that is complementary to the sequence that you're trying to probe and then attach a fluorophore to it, right, to uh, clarify where these microbes sit in the sample. However, what we do is uh, we take a DNA molecule, so we, we do a two-step hybridization scheme, and we tag the cells first with a DNA molecule that has uh, no fluorophores attached but two readout sequences. And then we use a second hybridization step that targets these readout sequences. And the reason why this is, uh, we think, a good idea is that, uh, that this allows us to use the same readout probes for multiple species and therefore uh, allows us to reduce the cost of the overall assay. And that is because these molecules that have a fluorophore attached to it are very expensive to synthesize. It can cost $100 for a single sequence, whereas this molecule that is just a DNA molecule uh, this molecule can be synthesized uh, with array technologies, and you can, uh, you can order pools of thousands of different sequences for on the order of a few thousand dollars. So the cost per sequence is really on the order of cents rather than hundreds of dollars. So that lowers the cost of the technique. Uh, then we take advantage, uh, so then we use spectral imaging, and I'll get to, into that a little bit more. Uh, on a standard confocal microscope equipped with five laser, laser lines, and then we measure the spectral response in response to these five uh, laser lines. And then finally, we use a machine learning classifier to classify, to, to um, relate the spectral barcodes to the uh, species barcodes that we've assigned. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, because uh, there's many ribosomes present in each cell, we can use combinations of different colors. And so this, uh, this uh, technique of two-step hybridizations where we, use where we can use multiple readout sequences targeting the same species allows us to color 
uh, bacterial cells with, uh, with combinations of up to 10 different fluorophores. Uh, and this is just an example of E. coli in culture that has been labeled in this, in this manner. Uh, this is a single cell segmentation that we've done to automatically register where cells start and end. And then we record again with five different laser lines, we record the spectral response of these cells, and then we concatenate them, right? So every cell, every uh, excitation laser leads to a different response and we concatenate them to create this type of spectral barcode that is then unique to the uh, fluorophore combination that we've attached to uh, these individual cells. Here are the reference spectra measured in the same way uh, for the uh, pure fluorophores that we've used. So we've used up to combinations of up to 10 different fluorophores in this experiment. And these are the fluorophores we've used. And you can see that their uh, emission spectra are very, very uh, distinct. Uh, however, then, of course, the, the opportunity here is to, is to combine uh, the, uh, the spectra of these different fluorophores to create these n-bit words where uh, the number n uh, is equal to 10. Uh, and that allows us to make up to 1,023 uh, combinations. And then really the, the challenge is to, is to dis discriminate these, these various uh, spectral barcodes. And normally, you know, until a few years ago, uh, what, we, what I would have suggested is to just simply uh, do some curve fitting uh, find peaks in the spectra, find the widths of the peaks, and so on. Uh, but we've, what we find uh, in, uh, in experiments is it's much easier to use machine learning approaches that uh, they can classify these spectral barcodes. Now, the only challenge uh, for the machine learning based approach is that you need examples. And so in order to create examples of all possible barcodes, what, did, what we did was to stain uh, E. coli isolates, uh, 1,023 E. coli isolates, with all possible combinations of these uh, 10 fluorophores. And, that, and so that requires us to uh, create this library of 1,023 different isolates uh, that have different spectral barcodes. And not only that, we also had to image them so that we could use the images as an example for the barcode, barcode classifier. Uh, and that's what uh, how set out to do. Um, and here, again, so just a few examples here. And then what we do here is uh, we show all the spectral barcodes. Uh, for all cells that we've imaged. So we image hundreds of thousands of cells for each, uh, for each barcode. And then we represent all of these data using dimensional reduction, uh, namely uh, UMAP. And what you can see is that these, uh, every blob here consists of a thousand or so data points. What you can see is that these, these data points are resolved. They don't overlap, already indicating that you can indeed resolve these, these, these barcodes. We use this UMAP uh, uh, dimensional reduction followed by uh, a support vector machine uh, to then later classify uh, these barcodes. Uh, we've tested the accuracy of our, of our uh, classifier uh, by uh, simulating uh, using multivariate normal distributions where the mean and the covariance are extracted from experimentally measured spectra for each barcode. We've simulated barcodes and these are the all possible 1023 barcodes shown here in a, with a heat map. Uh, and uh, this is a result. And for most barcodes, uh, the error is undetectable. Uh, and there's a few barcodes for which the error is indeed detectable, but very, very small. Okay. And then we've also used uh, photon counting experiments to evaluate the relationship between the number of fluorophores or the number of ribosomes in a cell and, uh, and, and the error rate in the classifier. And we find that for cells with more than 1,000 uh, ribosomes, uh, that the, the error rates are, are vanishingly small. To test the system further, we took this library of 1,023 species labeled with all possible combinations of uh, 10 fluorophores, and uh, we mixed them together. First, we mixed them in equal, uh, equal um, quantities, and then we, uh, uh, imaged the, we, we labeled the community and we imaged the community. Uh, and this is just an example where we've, uh, of, of a segmented image where we fal false color the image by uh, spectral barcode. Um, and this, uh, we then counted the number of cells in, these bar in, in this community, and we find that every barcode out of uh, all possible 1,023 barcodes is represented in this community. Uh, so the, 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 the mean abundance or the median abundance is close to one in 1,000 as one would expect. And also the distribution uh, follows the expected distribution. So we were quite happy with that. I was specifically happy with that, but then how explain to me that uh, you would get the same result if the classifier would just uh, be a random classifier that's just always uh, 
uh, yields a random barcode. And so then we had to do another experiment where we mix the barcodes in unequal uh, um, proportions. And we did that in eight uh, batches. So we created eight batches of 127 or 128 synthetic communities. And we again imaged uh, many cells of that and we, was, we compared the measured abundance, the, the measured uh, frequency by which we see a certain barcode to the expected uh, abundance and we find an excellent correlation. And so we were quite happy with that. As a further validation, we then also uh, uh, assayed and tested uh, a complex community consisting of different microbes, including uh, both gram-positive and gram-negative uh, microbes. And we designed three different panels where we assigned different barcodes to each species. Uh, first, we had a random panel where the barcode was just a random barcode and assigned to each, uh, each species. Then we had one that we called the least complex where we tried, where we have the least possible fluorophores assigned to each of these 11 uh, species. And then we have one that we call the most complex and that is one where barcodes that consist of lots of ones, that is to say, uh, we use a lot of fluorophores to label these cells. And obviously it becomes more complex to discriminate these, these spectral barcodes that, uh, have that consist of many, many fluorophores. Uh, we evaluated the accuracy here by comparing uh, the expected barcode and the measured barcode, and we, we show here the Hamming distance between the assigned barcode and the, and the, uh, the measured barcode. And we find that uh, in the vast majority of cases, this Hamming distance is zero, meaning that the assigned barcode, the, the measured barcode is, is the same as the assigned barcode, so that's great. Uh, in a few instances, there were some errors, but they were very infrequent. I'm showing here the same data. Uh, in a different plot. Uh, and again, uh, a Hamming distance of zero signifies no error. And there were just a few species, uh, mostly those, um, those labeled with the most complex uh, spectral barcodes where, we, where, where some error is measurable, but we were quite happy with that. Uh, in order to then uh, use this technology to probe actual environmental microbiomes, uh, we performed 16S amplification and then bio sequencing to generate a library of 16S sequences that exist in the sample. Uh, and at the same time, and this, this then allowed us to uh, design probes. And then we uh, ordered, you know, complex oligo pools and stained these, uh, these complex communities with these complex oligo uh, probes. Uh, and then finally, uh, we performed spectral imaging and then segmentation. I'll get into the details of that uh, to create this type of uh, spatial maps that are a digital representation of the microbiome that allow us to extract things like cell size, cell shape, and so on. Uh, the probe design is, is performed uh, in an automated fashion. We often generate thousands of probes to, uh, to uh, measure a single community. So it's, it's not possible to do this by hand. So we do this uh, using software. And then we order complex oligo pools. Uh, these are just single-stranded DNA uh, oligos that are created by uh, that are synthesized by array technologies, and we uh, amplify this pool uh, by first ligating a T7 promoter, then doing in vitro transcription, uh, and then um, uh, we do reverse transcription and remove the RNA to create an amplified uh, pool of single-stranded DNA probes that can be used for hyperfission. And these are just some examples. Uh, this is a human plaque biofilm, uh, two different regions on that biofilm. And you can see that there's different cells that make up that biofilm uh, and that there's very different morphologies, different colors obviously correspond to different species. And you can see that there's lots going on and cells also have wide ranging uh, cellular shapes. Uh, this is an example image of a, a murine gut microbiome. This is a section of, of a mouse gut. Uh, each dot here is an individual cell. The different colors correspond to different species. The larger particles here that you see are food particles and not actually microbes. Uh, and so it's these type of data really that, uh, that conclusively show to us that hyperfish is very useful to make shit look pretty. Uh, but to make it actually useful, uh, we had to develop uh, segmentation algorithms to obtain actual quantitative information from these type of uh, data. What you have to do is develop software that can uh, in an automated fashion, figure out where cells start and end uh, and what the, and can associate the species identity with different spectral responses. And so that actually required quite a bit of uh, technology development work. Uh, we of course first tried segmentation approaches that have been uh, described before. We used the watershed algorithm, which is a great uh, segmentation algorithm, but the watershed algorithm requires a seed to start the segmentation. And it's really defining that seed that is, uh, that is the, the complex or difficult part. Uh, 
Uh, you can try to do this via different tools. There's a tool, there's a, there's a technique called the Otsu's method, which was developed by um, an imaging scientist called Otsu, uh, which is a technique that just finds a, a single threshold that, uh, that minimizes the intra-class intensity variance, or which, which turns out to be equivalent, uh, maximizes the inter-class uh, variance, and finds a, a single threshold. Now, if you use uh, this Otsu method to define a seed for watershed, the segmentation is just not, uh, not, not, not accurate. And so we uh, decided to develop our own technique. We, we call this local neighborhood enhancement. And so this is not a segmentation technique, but rather a pre-processing tool. It allows us to generate a seed for hyperfish. And the way this works is that we create line profiles around each voxel or pixel in the image. And we look around in the neighborhood of that pixel. Uh, and uh, we first, uh, so we, we look in all possible directions for a 2D image, uh, all possible directions in a 2D plane for a 3D image, uh, all possible directions in, in a 3D uh, volume. And uh, we uh, normalize the images along these uh, line profiles. And then we also measure the quartile coefficient of variation. And then we do two things. We normalize by just uh, normalizing all the data between zero and one. So that, that allows us to normalize the global image. Uh, and the second thing we do is we account for variation. And so what this does is this factor here, what it does is it creates, it enhances the contrast between pixels that sit in the middle of the cell that have a low quartile coefficient of variation because any direction you will look, uh, the image will look uniform versus pixels that sit on the edge of a cell where if you look in different directions, uh, there will be larger variation in the intensity. Uh, and so this, uh, this correction here, what it really does is it enhances the contrast between pixels that sit in the volume versus pixels that sit on the edge. And so this is, an, an, going back to this example of the, of the biofilm image, uh, this is the, uh, the result of the uh, local neighborhood enhancement um, uh, algorithm that finds a seed for watershed. And then this is the watershed segmentation that results from that. Um, here are just a few examples, just because they're pleasant to look at. This is another patch of biofilm, uh, oral biofilm. Here's, uh, here's a segmented image of that biofilm. Here's another example uh, that nicely illustrates that this, this technique is able to also uh, find cells and segment cells that have unusual shapes, which is, which is one of the challenges here with the uh, image format the, that we have. And here are just a, a few other examples of, uh, of patches of oral biofilm uh, that just show uh, the diversity of species and the patchiness of these landscapes. Uh, we performed a longitudinal experiment, so a volunteer collected samples over uh, a more than two year time period after refraining from oral hygiene. Originally, we figured we would refrain for two years, but then we decided to do it two days before each sample collection. And then uh, we did two things. We did hyperfish and then also super resolution imaging to look at the details of the, the nanoscale structures of the ribosomes within these cells. And so uh, here are again, uh, th this is again an image of an oral biofilm. This is the segmented image. So this is a digital representation uh, of this original image. And you can zoom in and for example, find uh, classic or canonical corn cup structures, which are, are formed by spherical cells that are in consortium with long filamentous cells. We also find evidence of hedgehog structures on top of the biofilms. These are formed by Corinibacterium. Uh, Porphyromonas was detected very often, and this is a known member of the oral microbiome. But we also observed, for example, here, uh, Filifactor, which, uh, which has not previously been um, uh, resolved by imaging studies in the oral biofilm, and which is a known which is a bacteria that is known to be associated with periodontal disease. And so that just highlights some of the transla translational uh, benefits of this, of this technology. Um, as a further validation, we specifically looked at Lotropia cells because they're easy to recognize. They form this uh, pleomorphic cocoid structures. And we designed different panels that, uh, that probe the community and that have different uh, barcodes assigned to each species. And so in these, you know, we did this in a random fashion. And the different probe sets here have different barcodes associated with Maltropia. And in, in each case, we find these, uh, you know, the, the segmentation uh, and the barcode assignment seems to be correct based on uh, the, the morphology of these cells that is, that is nicely or easily recognizable. And we'd also study the mechanical properties of these cells as measured by these different probe sets. And we find that they are very similar, sort of uh, giving us further confidence in the technique. <clears throat> 
Uh, we find some new things like cells of the, the genus of Ficure cola in consortium with Rotia. Uh, we also find cells like Lacno and Provotella that have, again, not previously been imaged or reported in imaging studies. And that's because they're low, uh, they have low prevalence. They're not very abundant in these micro, uh, microbiomes. You can look at the structures of uh, species like Actinomyces. Uh, we thought there was some regular structure, but then we used for Yeh analysis and we found that there's no short or long uh, range order in these, in these structures. Uh, because we've quantified the cells in their local environments, uh, um, and we can count cells in patches of the environment, we can actually also uh, use this to study ecology. And you can, you can, for example, quantify the species diversity, which you can also do by, by sequencing. You only need a list for that. But we can be, go beyond that. For example, we can compute the, the break curtis dissimilarity between species that occupy patches as a function of the distance between these patches. And what you can see here for the microbiomes, you find that these oral microbiomes are actually very stable. We see very similar structures and repeated patterns over this two, two year time period. What you see is that the dissimilarity increases very quickly as you increase the, the distance between these random patches, which is something that we don't find for the, the gut microbiome. So indicating, together these results indicate that the oral biofilm is much more patchy than the, the gut microbiome, as you might expect. We can also measure the diversity of a local habitat compared to uh, the diversity of the global ha habitat, which is a data diversity. And you can do this as a function of the patch size, for example. And here we've just scaled the patch sizes. And we find, as you would expect, that the data diversity decreases as you increase uh, the, the patch size. You can then, uh, analyze networks. So one thing that is enabled by, by hyperphages, you can actually count the number of contexts that exist between cells of different genera. Uh, and uh, we can measure networks. And so this, this network analysis here just uh, quantifies the number of contexts between uh, uh, repre representatives of the different genera, uh, genera here. Uh, and in order to uh, account for differences in abundance and shapes and so on. We also compare this measured network to a random network where we've just scrambled the species identities. And that allows us to then ascertain whether the networks are stable or not over time. And we find that they are indeed uh, stable. So you find a repeated sort of uh, associations and consortia uh, of microbes in these oral biofilms, which is, which, which is quite interesting. Uh, you can zoom in and you can, you can create three-dimensional segmentations and we find uh, one novel microbial consortium that consists of uh, these three different species. Cardiobacterium is actually an interesting one because it's, it's associated with endocarditis. And we've seen this consortium in, in multiple patches in, in, in different samples collected at different time points. Um, and then we've, as I mentioned, we, we, we performed hyperfish and we can actually on the same sample perform super resolution imaging by area scan imaging. Uh, to uh, resolve detailed structures within these individual cells. And I'll just highlight a few examples. Here is an example of Olsonella that we detected in this complex microbiome. And this is a, a gram-positive microbe uh, that has been reported to occur uh, in short to very long serpentine chains. And this is exactly what we find here. So this, the structure that we see in our environmental microbes is very similar to what has been reported in culture studies. And so this is interesting because now it allows us to study the morphologies of these species, sometimes species that cannot be cultured in their native uh, environment. Uh, then uh, we've also looked at cells of uh, the genus of Lotropia. Again, these, these are easily uh, recognized as these polymorphic coccoid structures. Uh, and again, you can sort of clarify that by super resolution imaging. Uh, here are examples of, of 10 different species. Uh, and uh, in, in many cases, uh, in those cases where images from culture are available, we find a good relationship between the structures we find and the structures that are reported. And in other cases, the overall sizes and, and whether they form change or not is, is consistent with what, what, what has been reported in in the literature, which provides sort of further uh, confidence in the accuracy of the method. Uh, I should say that uh, for these longer cells, we've computationally straightened the cells. So these, for example, this example of Lacno uh, uh, bacterium, uh, uh, you won't find it as a straight rod, it's, it's, uh, but, but we've stra uh, computationally straightened it. You find these very long uh, cells or, or, or series of or chains of cells uh, in, these, uh, in these complex microbiomes, which is quite, quite interesting. And the ribosome distributions are very different from one species to the next.
Then we also looked at the mouse gut, gut microbiome under different antibiotic uh, conditions. And this is just an example of a raw image and then the segmentation. What you see here is the, uh, what remains of the mucus layer. This is the, the host uh, epithelial layer that is observed. Um, here too, we find many members of uh, Bacteroides, which is totally expected for the gut microbiome. But we also see cells like uh, Macellar Bacteroides and Bondi Baculum, which are members of the, uh, of the uh, gut microbiome that have only recently uh, been discovered. And then you can, you can do different types of uh, measurements on these structures. For example, you can compute a pair correlation, which, uh, which quantifies uh, the density of particles with respect to a reference particle. Okay. And so what you see here is that bacteroides form these repeated structures with, with uh, an average size of about of a few microns, whereas pelli are more uniformly dis distributed in the microbiome. Again, zooming in on these two species, Espelli and bacteroides, we find that bacteroides tend to cluster close to the uh, mucus layer. So this is the distance to the mucus layer, whereas Hespelli are more uniformly distributed in the gut microbiome. And this is something that has been observed before uh, using other, uh, other techniques. Uh, we looked at uh, two different types of antibiotics, clindamycin and Cipro. I will uh, go into the details of the analysis for, for Cipro. Uh, here are just, again, some raw images and then the segmented images. And, and again, the gray area here, uh, the, the gray area in the segmentation, and this area here in the, in the raw image, those are the, this is the host tissue there or the host epithelial uh, cells. Uh, you can quantify the abundance of different uh, genera. We find that, uh, uh, that bacteroides become more abundant after uh, antibiotic treatment, which is something that has been described before. We also find that the species diversity, overall diversity, increases with antibiotic exposure, which is again something that uh, has been reported before. And we find, much like what we saw with oral biofilm, that the beta diversity uh, decreases very quickly as you consider larger and larger pet sizes. And again, I think this is actually quite interesting. You can now start to test theories from ecology. Uh, uh, island biogeography and so on, but actually in microbiomes. And this is really enabled by hyperfish because we can quantify, we can count cells within local environments. I, again, you can quantify uh, the break courteous uh, dissimilarity between patches and we find that those are quite similar uh, between uh, the control and antibiotic treated mice. And then again, we can look for these spatial associations and we can count the number of contacts that exist between cells of different, uh, different genera. Uh, and we compare this again uh, against uh, random configurations that we've, that we've computed from the same maps. And a few things stand out. You know, the spatial associations are indeed altered by uh, antibiotic treatment. Specifically, you know, the greatest fall difference was observed between Acidobacter and Bellonella, which are uh, linked to altered inflammatory res responses and metabolic activities of the host. And so these type of observations can now be, you know, tested in, you know, using other experiments or, or other biological verification. So this is all the work I should emphasize again. This is the graduate work from how she is about to graduate and uh, he's on the market for postdoc positions. I'll just mention. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I would like to uh, uh, go over the results from, from a completely different study where we've used uh, uh, spatial sequencing in conjunction with single cell sequencing to study the early development of the heart. And so we were particularly interested in the early development. The, the heart development has been studied before in, in mouse models, in human uh, systems also. Uh, but uh, the heart is one of the first functional organs, organs to uh, develop. And uh, cardiogenesis involves uh, events that happen very at very early stages. And so in order to be able to study uh, these events uh, in detail, in particular the events that, that are early events that are likely the important events, uh, we, we use a chicken model because this chicken model allowed us to uh, uh, recover hearts at a very early stage and uh, collect sufficient cells for, for example, single cell RNA sequencing analysis by pooling of many, many hearts, which is much more difficult to achieve uh, in other animal models. It's easy to do with uh, with X with, with chicken because the, the 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 chick develops ex utero in an egg. Okay, and so the one we, we did here was to combine single cell RNA sequencing with spatial transcriptomics, basically the Visium uh, platform, and then we integrated these two analysis procedures together to do. Uh, to perform a spatially resolved analysis. And so the methods, really briefly, I think those are very familiar for most in the audience. 
uh, the methods include uh, three prime single cell RNA sequencing uh, using chromium, right? And here, obviously, uh, messenger RNAs are captured using these polity oligos that are barcoded that allow to perform uh, measurements of single cell gene expression. And, and then we use the Visium platform, which does, does something very similar, but with these similar oligos uh, attached to specific uh, locations of a, a microscope slide, and then you just essentially put a piece of tissue on this uh, on this uh, slide, and then uh, the the messenger RNAs are locally captured by these oligos, and that allows you to connect gene expression with spatial location. Okay, and so these are just some uh, some uh, characterization results. We just a number of transcripts detected, a number of genes detected in these samples using both single cell RNA, RNA sequencing and spatial sequencing. And we performed this analysis for four different time points so that we could look at temporal changes. Uh, we've looked at uh, the correlation between the spatial data and the single cell data. And we find that in general, as you would hope and, and probably expect, we find that they are very strongly correlated. However, there are some outliers that I'd like to point out here in the day four and day seven sample. We see a much higher expression of hemoglobin uh, transcripts and what you see in the spatial analysis. And I think this is just a nice example of an artifact, namely uh, free RNA from blood cells that is very difficult to just uh, completely remove uh, that you can identify by combining uh, these two technological platforms. And so one of the things that, that we find beyond just the biological observations that I'll go into the details of, we find that these two techniques actually enrich one another quite nicely. Uh, and uh, make one another more robust. And this is just one, one example of, of things that you, issues that you can mitigate by combining both spatial sequencing with single cell RNA sequencing. And we also find that the spatial transcriptomes are very similar for samples collected at the same time point as you, as you would hope and expect. Uh, then we've done uh, data integration uh, for these multiple time points uh, by Scanorama then uh, dimensional reduction and clustering. And this revealed 15 distinct clusters uh, from different lineages, from the three main lineages within, uh, within the heart, uh, myocardial, endocardial, and epicardial lineages. Um, and uh, we also find some erythrocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells, which are presumably just circulating cells, uh, but might also be uh, cells that are embedded in these in these tissues or resident in, the, in these tissues. There's one cell population here. This is a thymosine beta four high cell uh, population. This is a, this is a population of cells that express this molecule at very uh, high levels, and they're actually this is a very heterogeneous cell population uh, that is quite interesting with a representation from different time points and different lineages. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, in order to, so. We didn't want to, so on the right, on the left, you, of course, you see the single cell RNA sequencing data. On the right, you see the spatial RNA sequencing data. Here, we've also done dimensional reduction. We've sort of analyzed it independently of the single cell uh, RNA-seq data. Uh, we've done dimensional reduction and then colored uh, the different clusters that we identified by anatomical region. And we find that these anatomical regions indeed make sense, right? So if you didn't know anything about the anatomy, anatomy of the heart, you would be able to recapitulate it from these, these type of measurements. But of course, then we have these two independent measurements and we would like to you know, combine them and integrate them together into individual analysis. And in order to do that, we used uh, the Sura V3 uh, package to do anchor-based integration. This approach first identifies anchors between the data sets, which uh, represent pairwise correspondences between elements that, that uh, or, or seem to originate from the same biological states. And then you can use these anchors to harmonize the data sets by learning a joint structure as is visualized here uh, with uh, canonical correlation analysis. Um, and so that allows us to do a few things. First of all, it allows us to transfer the cell type labels that we, uh, that we defined based on marker gene expression, of course, uh, from the single cell RNA sequencing analysis, we, we can transfer these labels now to the spatial maps. And so here, what we've done is we've, we've, we've colored the, uh, the maps, the spatial transcriptomic maps by uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, cell type in the local neighborhood. Okay, so we're, we're, we're coloring by plurality, if you wish. Uh, but you can do something else. You can also, uh, because every spot, uh, I should say that these spots are about 50 microns in size, so that you don't achieve single cell resolution. There's maybe on the order of 10 cells or so that are probed by each spot. Uh, and so you can imagine that each spot consists of uh, a weighted mix of different cell types, if it's indeed a mixture. 
And you can actually, from this uh, label transfer, you can use the prediction scores from this label transfer to obtain weights uh, for the composition of the, of the local spot. And so that allows us to compute this type of pie charts and, and recapitulate what the local or the composition is of the local neighborhood. And so you can also visualize this. And this is, again, the same spatial map here where we uh, have colored or where we've labeled all the spots on the h and &E image uh, as, a, as a pie chart. And you can see that better in this, in this particular zoom in. Um, given that we've done all that, now we can actually compute uh, proximity maps, and these are uh, these. This could be important because pr proximity is, of course, important for or is a necessity for uh, physical interactions between cell types. And so, by computing these uh, proximity maps, we can actually uh, compute uh, these core diagrams that that uh, recapitulate which cell types tend to interac interact with what other cell types at different stages of development. And we find, for example, that cardiomyocytes are co-localized with myocardial progenitor cells in all stages, as you would expect, and then also significant co-localization of myocardial cells with endocardial cells uh, at day seven, uh, and with vascular endothelial fibroblast cells at day 10 and day 14, which is also expected, but it's nice to see uh, come out of this type of analysis. Uh, and then uh, we uh, ventured further, and so, uh, again, this is, this is similar to what I've shown before. Here we've used uh, dimensional reduction on the spot transcriptomes, so local bulk transcriptomes. Uh, we've done dimensional reduction and, and clustering and then labeling of these clusters. And we annotate the clusters by their most likely anatomical regions, which then also allows us to measure cell type composition in these different anatomical regions. And I think this is another strength of the spatial analysis because it allows you to actually measure these uh, the cell type composition, the local cell type composition with, with great precision, and you're not biased. Uh, I want to emphasize there's no bias uh, with respect to, for example, the isolation of cells or the dissociation of the tissue. Uh, you can now actually quantify the abundance of uh, less common cell types or potentially even new cell types in their local neighborhood uh, without being affected by without being limited by the, the limitations of things like facts or single cell RNA-seq where you're always biased by, uh, again, the likelihood that the, the, the cell will show up in the dissociation. And so you, you can correct for these, uh, these, these differences in abundance, which is quite neat. Um, then the other thing you can do with the spatial analysis, of course, look for uh, uh, the left or, or asymmetry of expression. And we find many examples of that. For example, we find that T-box transcription factor five uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, constrained to the left ventricle at early stages, but not later. And the chromogranin B uh, is restricted to the right ve uh, ventricle on day seven and later. And then we find also that these differences are diminished by day 14. And I, I haven't mentioned this before, but day 14 is sort of when all these, uh, these, these cardiogenesis pro processes have come to their conclusion. And then we also find that myoglobin is upregulated in compact myocardium, uh, and that this upregulation, actually, this is another nice thing that you can do. You can find that this upregulation is, is both due to an increase in the number of myocytes and an increase in the expression of this uh, myoglobin within these uh, myocells within the compact uh, myocardium. Um, I'll mention this also briefly. Of course, you can do trajectory analysis. We've done this for all the major lineages. I'll, I'll just uh, go over this pretty quickly, but I think it's actually quite neat. You can actually take this, this combined data set, the single cell RNA sequ sequencing data set where you do the lineage analysis, and then the spatial sequencing data set. And you can transfer uh, the pseudotimes um, that, you've, uh, that you've computed from the single cell analysis onto the spatial maps. And that's quite interesting because it allows you to visualize where uh, transitionary cell states are localized. Right? And you see that, for example, uh, in day seven, there's a high uh, variance within the epicardial uh, lineage, indicating sort of connections between changes in morphology and this uh, and cellular development. I mentioned that there's this, uh, this collection of cells that's quite curious that is that we call the thymosine beta high cells because they express this molecule uh, at high levels. And we find actually that there's multiple clusters within that, that particular uh, major cluster. Uh, there's endocardial cells, smooth muscle cells, and vascular endothelial cells. But which, what is curious is that these, uh, the endocardial and cardiomyocyte cells uh, 
are mostly representatives of the early samples, so day 47, whereas the smooth muscle cells and the vascular and the telial cells are most often detected at later stages. You can do, uh, you can do, you can, you can look for upregulation or downregulation of specific genes to sort of characterize uh, the phenotypes of that particular cell, uh, cell cluster. And what we find is that they upregulate uh, cells that uh, are related to cytoskeleton as genes that are uh, associated with cytoskeleton organization uh, and cell cycle progression, pro proliferation, and signaling. And so what we conclude is that this, this collection of cells exhibit a migratory phenotype with increased cytoskeleton organizational activity. And there's sort of a switch going from uh, time using beta expression in these endocardial cells, and then it switches to these, these other cell types, which is quite curious. You can map that out, also visualize it on the spatial maps. You can ask what cell types uh, this, this particular uh, cluster is interacting with. And then uh, I, I will mention briefly that we've done immunostaining to confirm the results from both the single cell RNA sequencing and the, the spatial analysis. And so this study just really uh, shows that you can use spatial temporal sequencing has been used uh, more often for different organ systems to reveal uh, how cellular differentiation and morphological changes co-occur. And so I think this is quite fascinating. Uh, in development to try and understand how uh, actual anatomical changes are connected to uh, cellular differentiation. Uh, we discovered this novel de development stage dependent role for a small secreted peptide called thymosin beta-4. And we think it's, it, it's involved in the coordination of multi-lineage uh, cellular populations because we see this, this switch. And then uh, uh, it, another conclusion, and this may be of interest to this audience, we find that you know, just a, the combination of single cell sequencing and spatial sequencing uh, has many benefits and allows you to you know, analyze these different data sets more robustly also. I think they, they uh, compensate for some of the, the limitations that, uh, that are associated with either. For example, the single cell uh, analysis enables you to improve effectively the spatial resolution of the, the spatial analysis and the spatial analysis can be used as sort of a technical validation and also uh, uh, as a technical validation of the, the single cell analysis and it allows you to do you know exact cell type composition measurements and so on. I'll briefly mention uh, the last part of the talk I'll just in a few minutes I'll, I'll just mention that we've been working uh, also improve it on improving uh, just standard single cell analysis uh, techniques. We like to use these droplet approaches because they're very high uh, throughput. And we all know how this, these work, but uh, we argue that there's a lot of information actually missed uh, when you use these techniques. And it's, it's sometimes underappreciated, not always, but sometimes underappreciated. And some of these limitations are due in part because of the reverse transcription step here that uh, biases these techniques towards longer ATL transcript, but then also often in the informatics because you often just start with an alignment to a genome and then a cross-reference with a genome uh, gene annotation. And so you're relying on the fact that these, these uh, uh, that the genome and the gene annotations are complete. And we find that that is not always the case if you look for model systems that are not the usual model systems. And so uh, in just a few minutes, I'll mention that we've developed a technique that uh, solves the first issue. Uh, we call this technique dart seek. So this is a drop seek bead. We all uh, know this, this bead has a poly uh, T tail here. It's a great way. To, so the, the, the purpose of these oligos on the beads is to prime reverse transcription and label the, the, uh, label the molecules with a cell barcode and, and a molecular barcode. Uh, but of course, this, uh, this technique is therefore limited to uh, ATL oligos. And that is a limitation because often, for example, uh, the transcripts of viruses uh, are often non-atailed and therefore, for example, many other examples uh, remain undetected. And so we developed this technique we call DART-seq. It's one of these reverse engineered acronyms uh, where we take a drop-seq bead and then ligate specific primers to the bead so that you can uh, amplify out other targets of interest. And you can do this in a multiplex uh, fashion and we've described this in detail in this paper. Uh, I'll jump over the results because I'm running out of time. Uh, and I just wanted to mention this other issue that exists with uh, single cell analysis, namely the fact that you start, you rely on the fact that the genome and the gene annotation is a perfect ground truth, which we find is not always the case. Uh, and so uh, we've developed bioinformatic approaches to deal with that. And so let's say you have a reference genome. Often you have you know, genes that are annotated, but in some cases, and this is particularly true for less studied model organisms, uh, 
there, are, there is transcriptional activity actually, in fact, outside of these uh, gene regions, right? And so if you use standard analysis procedures, you're essentially in the dark to this transcriptional activity. And so what we developed is, a, is an approach that uses a hidden Markov model to find islands of transcriptional activity in the genome uh, in an unbiased fashion. And then uh, essentially we'll label this either as annotated uh, transcriptionally active regions, ATARs or UTARs, uh, which are unannotated transcriptionally active regions. And then we take these stars, right, these transcriptionally active regions that are detected by the hidden Markov model. This is work by uh, my student, Michael Wong. Um, and we, uh, we do single cell analysis based on, on those, uh, those star regions and then annotate those. And then we find cell type specific expression of these uh, transcriptionally active regions and then annotate these regions that are unannotated based on gene homology analysis. And so why is this useful? Well, if you look at human, actually, if you look at the human gene annotation, specifically at gene annotations that are more recent, as you might imagine, those tend to be uh, comprehensive. You know, there's very little uh, transcriptional activity that is, that is not mapped out in the human genome. This is also true for the mouse. But if you look at species like the mouse lemur, the mole rat, the sea urchin, the chicken, uh, there's actually significant reads that fall outside of the annotations. And you might then ask, you know, are these, are these regions relevant? And well, you know, one way to address this is to, do, uh, is to do a single cell analysis based on just the unannotated, unannotated transcripts. And uh, what we do here is just, this is the, the top panel uh, is, the, is a UMAP with single cell cl and, and clustering and visualization of the expression based on gene information. But the middle row here is based on this unannotated un un uh, transcriptionally active regions. And what you can see is that for certain species, for the mouse, this doesn't work. But for other species that are less commonly studied, let's say the spleen of the naked mole rat or the lungs of the lemur, you find that you can actually cluster these, uh, these, uh, these data based on only the information that is outside of the existing gene annotation. And so that's quite compelling. We've quantified this more and, and found that you can that uh, that there's you can you can do differential gene expression of these uh, these transcripts and then you can as I mentioned label them based on gene homology analysis and we've done this for many species the mouse the chicken for chicken we find that there's more uh, unannotated activity um, at earlier stages of development than at later stages of development which is maybe expected. Uh, and for things like the naked mole rat, the sea urchin, the, the, the lemur, there's the, the gene annotations are, are very much lacking and there's lots of information that is recovered from this type of technique. And then you can also, again, use these spatial transcriptomics going back to the subject uh, of the seminar series, and you can map out these uh, unannotated transcripts. Uh, so that brings me to the summary. I've introduced hyperfish, which is a single cell spatial profiling technique to study the, you know, the local composition of dense micro microbial communities. Uh, I've talked about spatial temporal sequencing of developing hearts and how you can use that to reveal the interplay between cellular differentiation and morphogenesis. And I've briefly touched upon uh, molecular and bioinformatic tools to essentially expand the scope of single cell RNA-seq. And so that brings me to the to the acknowledgments, I would like to acknowledge again how she who developed this hyperfish technique, uh, Madhav Mantri, who was responsible for all the uh, the uh, chicken heart uh, work, together with uh, Guy Scuder, who's a student in in the lab of my collaborator Jonathan Butcher, and then uh, Phil Burnham and Vidu Sakia contributed to DartSeq, and Michael Wang uh, 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 led the, the the study into this uh, UTAR analysis. And with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, for listening to my talk, and, uh, and I'm open to questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is super impressive. Uh, so if, um, I, I believe anyone, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself, you can ask, uh, or you can also use in the chat box uh, to type in your questions. I think I have to stop sharing my screen in order to see, to see the chat, uh, chat box, but uh, yeah.
Yeah. Uh, maybe I can start with the uh, first question. I think I see some questions coming in the chat box as well, but I will take this privilege to ask the first question. Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah so when you uh, look at uh, just the teacher astrology of, so I believe I think the, the vision system allows you to look at the teacher astrology, right? So uh, what's the typical size of those chicken uh, and brownie chicken hearts and uh, how many cells? I, I think you mentioned a little bit, but uh, I suspect the cardiomyocytes are big, uh, but those endocardio and uh, uh, epicardio are probably smaller. Uh, but for cardiomyocytes, you are probably approaching a uh, single cell level. So I wonder if you can kind of extract those data points and uh, really compare so, uh, and uh, integrate with the single cell sequencing data. Yeah, that, that, so you, you can naturally superimpose the uh, spatial transcriptomes on top of the H and E stains. We, we, I don't think we've tried to segment actually in this in this particular experiment. We didn't try to uh, segment individual cells. Uh, I think these cells are the, 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 the spots are on the order of fifty microns or R fifty micron, and the, the spacing is fifty micron also. Uh, so I think in, in the vast majority of these spots should be, you know should be considered as sort of a small local bullet transcriptome or the transcriptome of uh, on the order of maybe 10 cells or so that contribute. Uh, the hearts are very small on the order of a few square, uh, a few millimeter in size. That'll actually allow us to, uh, the advantage of that, so for the single cell analysis, we actually had to pool many hearts in order to, to obtain sufficient cell numbers for uh, 10x single cell RNA-seq. Uh, for the spatial sequencing that has a nice uh, advantage that you can fit multiple sections within one square on the Visium chi uh, chip if you practice, you know, the transfer of these uh, sections a bit. And so, uh, that, yeah, that, that's quite quite convenient. And so. Yeah, so one question in the uh, chat I have a quick question. Sure. Um, I think someone else started talking. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I have a question. So it, the hyperfish method seems, or is very, very cool. And it seems like you have the structure side of structure and function of microbial communities figured out. How do you see this expanding to studying the function of microbial communities? Can you start looking at transcripts in addition to the structure, the taxonomic structure? Yeah, and that's something that Howe is very interested in doing is, is um, it's uh, expanding hyperfish indeed uh, with with probing of so here we've probed the 16s ribosomal RNA to to obtain the identity of the microbes to map uh, what species are present and where they sit and who they interact with uh, but it doesn't address the question as you mentioned what they do so we can figure out what who they are but not what they do uh, but in principle one could do that by targeting uh, messenger RNAs that are expressed by bacterial cells and again there's actually very few uh, technologies uh, available to do this at a single cell level. There was, was a nice paper uh, a couple of months ago on BioArchive, uh, but still it, it remains very difficult to quantify gene expression in microbes because the transcripts are less abundant, they're not detailed and so on. And so there's an argument for just doing that based on imaging. And so there's some interesting, you know, it would be interesting to sort of bring all the techniques that have, have been developed for uh, the analysis of mammalian gene expression, star map, and, and all these other techniques and apply them to uh, the microbiome. I think that would be fascinating. Also, I should mention, because then you can also probe, of course, a host using the same techniques, and you might be able not only to study interactions between microbes, but also between uh, the microbes and their hosts and immune cells and so on. And there's, a one, there's one question on the chat, Nevjian. I don't see the chat. Maybe I should stop sharing my screen, then I might, then I might see it. <laughs> 
Uh, so some, uh, Stephen Wang asks, how many primary probe did you use to target each ribosome uh, target? Uh, so yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, we, we use multiple probes per ribosomal RNA. So the, 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 the way to think about this uh, hyperfish technique is that it's, uh, it's not a single molecule fish technique, right? So we're not imaging individual molecules. There's hundreds of thousands of copies of the ribosomal uh, of the ribosome and therefore the ribosomal RNA that, that is available within an individual cell. And often they are certainly at the resolution of, of standard confocal microscope, you should imagine that they're sort of nicely, spatially, uniformly distributed across the volume of the cell. So really what you're doing is you're tagging the volume of, of bacterial cells rather, so it's like a single cell imaging technique rather than a single molecule imaging technique. So there's hundreds of thousands of uh, ribosomes per per cell that are available. And at the same time, you can then also try to design as many probes as you can, in fact, to target uh, a, a single uh, ribosomal RNA. And so you can use combinations of probes that, uh, that target different segments within a ribosomal RNA mole molecule. Uh, of course, they need to be specific. And for that reason, we developed this, uh, this uh, computational pipeline to develop these, these uh, probes simultaneously. And so one thing you should know is that you can actually go on Go online and you can order, you know, pools, complex pool, complex pools of thousands of uh, uh, DNA probes that then are then synthesized uh, with array technologies, and you can order these for a few thousand dollars. So you can really create these very complex uh, uh, probe pools uh, for a limited amount of money. And so the number of targets, I should also say, depends on the availability. Right? It depends on the complexity of the microbiome. Uh, for some species, I should also say. There's no, there's no uh, probe that is distinct enough, and so some species remain dark because you can't, you can't find a probe that is, that is different enough from other microbes. For some microbes, you, you can design many, many probes, and so we design as many as we can. Uh, maybe one more question. Uh, have you looked at uh, the tumor-related microbes using this technology? And you which microbes? Sorry, the cancer-related uh, microbe. Let's say HPV, right, on lymphomas or something like that. Yeah. So uh, there's actually yeah, HPV is is a virus, but uh, but there's actually some rich uh, recent literature on uh, the cancer-associated microbiome, and so there's actually a few uh, bacterial species that are, that are commonly associated with colorectal cancer or actually any, it's very likely actually that the microbiome is important for any cancer uh, where you have, that, that sits on an epithelial barrier, where you have an interaction with the microbial world. And so that's true for the skin, that's true for uh, possibly the lung, but certainly for colorectal cancer. And in colorectal cancer, I think the evidence is the strongest for a possible uh, involvement of microbes that can potentially breach the, the, the mucus layer uh, and, and be part of the, the, the cancer microenvironment. There's a few microbial species that are consistently found in tumors. Uh, and so we actually have a grant from the, uh, the National Cancer Institute to, to evaluate exactly that. So it's a great, it's a great, great suggestion. Yeah, uh, so, so I believe this uh, last uh, talk of the seminar series and uh, we, we do have, uh, 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 I think, a pretty good plan to move forward with the seminar series uh, to the uh, tuna face gray. And uh, I, I think uh, probably I may can uh, tell us a little bit. And uh, yeah, I apologize. I think I see you have, <laughs> you still have your mask on it. Uh, I think I may still mute yourself or if you already started. Oh, sorry. Okay. I've been actually talking. <laughs> okay. 
yeah. uh, since you, you also don't see from the mask, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we are starting actually at the end of July uh, and 31st and after giving a, a big week break. And uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Moore from ETH and the second one, Dr. Drias from BU. And then we will also have now a few more uh, speakers from industry. Dr. Jiang He from uh, Vision, uh, the company commercializing Murfish, and then Dr. Oliver Bra Braubach from Ecoe Biosciences, also the company commercializing Codex. Then we will have a few more uh, academic uh, presenters from, uh, for instance, EMBL, Dr. Theodor Alexandro, and he's been generating very cool technologies and applications in spatial metabolomics um, area. Then we have an opening here on the 11th of September. If anybody wants to present, please reach out. And then last, we have also uh, a speaker from ReadCore, and this is uh, yet to be confirmed. And we look forward to uh, having you on board as well. Thank you. Yeah, just so one, one last note, because uh, I'm extremely excited uh, to see we have many speakers from Europe. So we decided to shift in a schedule a little bit, uh, kind of one hour earlier, uh, such that we can accommodate uh, kind of more attendees from uh, European countries. So uh, keep that in mind. We're going to uh, start at 2 p.m. Uh, I think uh, July 31st or thir 31st uh, as the first talk uh, from Professor Andrea Small uh, from ETH uh, to kick off our seminar series three. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, you have a good weekend. Thank you.